Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our conference, Health Gains from Sustainable Development. My name is Hinrich Tölken. I am a medical doctor and a diplomat. I work for the Federal Foreign Office. I'm head of the Division for Climate and Environmental Diplomacy and Sustainable Economy, and it is my honor and my pleasure to co-host this meeting in the afternoon with my colleague, Dr. Dora. Um, we in the Foreign Office, we tend to take a very international perspective also when looking at these global challenges such as climate change, biodiversity, global water management, but also health issues. Here in the World Health Summit, I know that um, health is often discussed within national borders, but I also believe that the challenges that are caused by health problems and health issues go beyond borders, and in fact, borders become irrelevant or even a hindrance when dealing with these global challenges on a planetary level. So we need to find common solutions. From my work, I know that when it comes to climate change or water management, it's very difficult often to define health gains. And sometimes it may also, may also be important to look at health gains in a category that, if, that is defined by avoiding harmful effects that non-sustainable policies could cause. And this is most visible when it comes to water management, but also in climate protection and protection of biodiversity, where populations, for example, stand to lose a lot by lacking or degraded, degrading ecosystem services. This afternoon, we have a rather diverse panel with uh, very interesting and heterogeneous contributions from different uh, scientific backgrounds. And uh, for the first presentation, I'm very happy and proud to be able to welcome the Minister of Health, Her Excellency um, Dr. Sherry Ayete from Ghana. Um, Minister Ayete is Minister of Health from Ghana since this year. She has been Minister for Science and Technology in the five years before, and I would now like to give the floor to Minister Ayete. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I want to make some few remarks on health gains from a sustainable uh, development. Uh, within the last 50 years, uh, most African countries have made a systematic uh, growth at improving you know, the health outcomes of our populations. In almost all countries, child mortality has reduced. Some progress has been made in reducing maternal mortality, and life expectancy has also risen, although it still remains the lowest in the world. While these improvements have been very slow, they represent some progress in the face of widespread poverty, continuing epidemics, persistent food insecurity, and pockets of instability across um, the African continent. Some of the causes of Africa's health challenges has been linked to the weakness in our political commitment for better health in Africa. However, shattering effects of such as civil conflicts, drought, and falling commodity prices cannot be overlooked. The deep-seated poverty in Africa and the prevalence of indigenous disease, which either intensify poverty or are the result of poverty, also contribute to the challenges that we are facing in Africa. Malaria, an ancient old disease, alone costs an estimated $12 billion in lost wages across the African continent. Healthcare under these circumstances is not only about treating diseases, but also about the physical environment, the structure of the population, the need to deal with negative aspects of local culture, and overall drive to make health a political priority 
on the continent. There are other, also other challenges that face Africa, and the biggest that we face in Africa is the availability of human resources for healthcare delivery. It is estimated that 3% of the world's health workers are deployed in sub-Saharan Africa, and yet Africa supplies skilled health workers to developed countries. The skilled worker to uh, population ratio has been so worse that uh, we currently have about two physicians per 10,000 of the population compared to a global average of 15. Similarly, we also have nursing and midwifery personnel to population ratio of 11 to 10,000 in Africa compared to the global average of 28 to 10,000 in Africa. This brain drain has reduced you know, some of the technical issues that needs to be reversed so that uh, Africa can face you know, health issues and also reduce maternal and mortality rates. Over the last 20 years, Sub-Saharan Africa has experienced the fastest urban growth rates in the world, leading to urban large settlements in the urban areas. And this is actually a problem for most African countries. When you look at uh, urban migration, uh, then uh, you have to think about uh, sanitation, deterioration of uh, the health facilities and amenities in the urban areas, and also the health facilities in the urban areas cannot sustain the overgrowing population in the urban areas. And this actually causes more disease burden on the economy, and also it creates the source for new epidemics. Health and development are therefore you know, linked, and modern development practitioners need to recognize to put health at the center of development. While the link between development and health may not be straightforward, it is generally agreed that one of the central themes of development is to help fight poverty and to provide community opportunities for better health services. Therefore, sustainable development, with its focus on poverty reduction, becomes a necessary long-term strategy for health improvements. The contribution of health to population, to economics, and to social development of countries has never been in doubt. We talk about deforestation. We talk about uh, provision of good drinking water. We talk about uh, food security. It is also acknowledged that the sustainable development provides basis for improved health. At the same time, improved health is also seen as a prerequisite for sustainable development. The concept of sustainable development is also linked to the uh, energy, the supply of energy, efficiency in energy supply, and looking at energy supply and people's health. Currently, you know, for women, you know, we have problems with them using um, open uh, uh, firewood because uh, we have this concept about black carbon that affects the respiratory system of uh, many women. All over the country, over two million women die from black carbon. So it is important that if we're talking about sustainable development, then we must also look at you know, affordable energy source for rural community. And especially so for developing country, there are also many studies associated with sustainable agro-industry. The Rio Declaration of 1992 makes the association between health and sustainable development a human rights issue, as it ties the right to a healthy and productive life to the extent to which development sustains improvement in health. This requires government's approach to the need for development with commitment to ensuring the availability of safe drinking water, safe environment, especially for children to grow and develop. 
safe housing, access to healthy food, and also transportation so that uh, we can you know, reduce you know, emission from a polluted old age you know, transport system. We need to improve environmental pollution, air pollution, and these are issues that government needs to put into policy making so that uh, we will clean the environment and make sure that uh, our people uh, grow in a healthy environment. Government also requires to make real investments in goods and services, such as providing facilities at various vulnerable groups, vulnerable communities. Facilities are provided, but the facilities must provide affordable quality health care to the people within the vulnerable groups. In my country, we have embarked on establishing community uh, health centers at very at disadvantaged areas so that uh, we can get many, many people to have access to Medicare. Um, this is one of our priority, accessibility and affordability, making sure that uh, everybody can at least have the right to good medical facility. In other countries, the rights continues to be violated in the name of development, because sometimes we also have you know, uh, investors who come to our country in the exploitation of minerals, and they also destroy our environment. They destroy water, they destroy the you know, forest, they degrade the land, and they make it uh, very difficult for communities to survive just because that um, they are you know, looking for foreign exchange in terms of mineral you know, resources. So we need to look at our foreign policy. We need to look at our investment policy. We need to look at our own internal development agenda so that we can balance these three, where sustainability and health can be provided to the people of Africa. In some cases, even water is destroyed and even contaminated to the point that uh, we need heavy investment to treat water so that um, our people can have portable water to drink. And this is very, you know, so where people in the extractive industry are guilty of. In other areas of development, environmental health factors that influence our health as air quality I mentioned earlier on needs to be emphasized. Noise pollution, pesticides, contamination of food tend to reduce the gains from agriculture and development. Communities that derive real gains from sustainable development care must be taken into the recognition that uh, we must control the use of pesticides for farmers. There is an important need that uh, farmers must be educated about how pesticides can be positive and how pesticides can be negative. Otherwise, you know, in trying to produce, in trying to increase um, domestic uh, you know, resources, they will end up also in uh, pesticides that will affect their health. And also, we have problems with children you know, suffering from um, lead poisoning because of pesticides and also because of pollution that come from overaged you know, vehicles. The challenge is that new and rapidly growing communities are springing up in the peripheral. So it is very important for us as policy makers to ensure that uh, we balance development and health. Ghana, for instance, we have concern about the contamination of our water bodies. And this is so because uh, we have a lot of illegal mining activities currently going on in our forest reserve. And definitely this will affect you know, agriculture in the forest zone. So we are very mindful and we are coming out with very stringent policies to ensure that uh, we can curtail illegal mining. These health concerns that have intensified as a result of uh, illegal mining has become very crucial to us. We are also looking at health issues concerned with migration from 
uh, rural areas to urban areas, and also across border migration. Uh, we have, you know, we are surrounded by other countries, about four different countries, and we had a problem when Cote d'Ivoire was uh, having, you know, internal problem. We had a lot of people migrating from Cote d'Ivoire to Ghana, and then also we had people migrating from Liberia to Ghana when we had the Liberian crisis, and this was a huge burden on our development because we had to, you know, vacate land meant for farming to allow them to settle. And they had different cultural backgrounds, but then we had to integrate these into our development agenda. So it is very important that uh, we look at healthcare in a very, you know, uh, three-dimensional way. We look at cost effectiveness, we look at the environment, and then we look at government's own policy that will drive sustainability in the healthcare sector. Then finally, we are also looking at the emerging resistance to affordable drugs for management of communi uh, com uh, communicable diseases and the high cost of treatment for non-communicable diseases. These mean a lot to our healthcare budget, so it is very important as we manage health care, we have to do a lot of research, especially malaria has been very long with us, and yet we are still fighting the treatment of malaria because the parasites have become resistant to drugs. So it's important that uh, we should do research to reduce uh, treatment, and also for non-communicable diseases, it is also important that government must set some budgetary allocation to enable us to you know, work out how we can incorporate this into our healthcare agenda. The linkages are there, they are difficult to draw experiences, and we think that our sustainability in the growth of our economies for which we must derive must benefit all of us as we say that um, Health is a human you know, right issue. We must look at economic growth in its relation to health, in its response to health service. It remains the central you know, role of sustainability. And this requires that healthcare should be accessible, offer good quality healthcare, and we need a political commitment to make sure that uh, we have increased healthcare, you know, providers to support our healthcare delivery. And we think that uh, in Ghana, sustainability must also be the goal for quality healthcare delivery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. You provided us with a, a very comprehensive and realistic picture of what health and development challenges are there. Not only the access to health systems and to treatment of disease, communicable and non-communicable, but also the range of issues from extractive industry, addressing resources, using them in the best way to pollution and to issues on human resources, for example. So I think it's a very good background. Uh, for us to start this discussion. We're very grateful for, for that startup. Um, uh, Carlos Dora from Public Health and Environment in WHO in Geneva, and I run the, the program that does, apart from many things, uh, indicators for the health sustainable development goals, for the new ones. Not for, not for the health goal, but for indicators for the other sustainable development goals and to see how is it that those goals can improve health. Now, I'm very interested to hear what the panel of experts have to say, because we are at a very crucial moment in the discussions. And we're going to start with a debate on the discussions, first with the first uh, big panel, um, pointing out some of the global, global uh, planetary boundaries provided by Professor Griggs. Professor Griggs is not sitting here, he's sitting in Australia, and he's giving that uh, short introduction on a video. Can you please uh, play the video? Professor Griggs is one of the big people who have been talking and writing 
about the planetary boundaries, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have him on, on the panel. I'm Dave Griggs. Uh, I'm director of the Monash Sustainability Institute at Monash University. And I'm very pleased to be able to give this presentation at the World Health Summit. And I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person. Although maybe that's a good thing because actually I don't know really anything about health. And so it means I can avoid all the hard questions. Um, but I hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay, I'm going to spend about the next 15 minutes talking about the UN process of agreeing sustainable development goals. And the first thing really to do when I do that is to say why are we bringing the word sustainable in here. So why are we talking about sustainable development instead of just development. And so I'm going to start off by running a little video which shows about some of the impacts that human beings are having on the planet. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing, we have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. So, what you can see is that we've reached a new ecological e epoch, the Anthropocene. Anthropocene, anthro meaning humans, so it's, a, it's an age when human beings are starting to dominate physical processes. And what you can see here is that the, you know, you, don't, you, you won't see from this graph all of the things that are up there, but whether we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, or population, GDP, damming of rivers, water use, fertilizer consumption, population, paper consumption, transport, motor vehicles, telephone communications, international travel, even the growth of McDonald's restaurants, all of those curves have the same shape. They all have that exponential increase kicking off in about 1950, when the population really started to grow off, the economic, economy started to grow, and things really started to take off. And what has happened is that the physical systems of the Earth have responded in exactly the same way, which is not surprising. So when you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, or ozone depletion, or floods, or surface temperatures, or damage to ocean ecosystems, 
or coastal zone structures or damage to ocean biogeochemistry or the amount of forest and woodland that we're losing or the amount of domesticated land that we're producing or global biodiversity loss, those curves all have guess, the same shape. So human beings are driving the system, the natural system is responding. To put that in another way, if we actually look at a measure of global impact, then you can measure that as a function of population, affluence, and technology on those three axes of that box that you can see. And what you can see in the very base of that little box is in 1900, that was our human impact in 1900. The second little box also right down at the bottom shows 1950. So even by 1950 our global human impact was still very small. By 2011, that's the whole box. So by, by 2011, our global human impact had just expanded you know, tremendously. And so what that led a, 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 some scientists to do was to look at, are we still in what we call a safe operating space for humanity within these natural systems? Or are we in what we call, I would be termed planetary boundaries? So what you see there in the green center is if uh, we look at a range of things from climate change, ocean acidification, stratospheric ozone depletion, the biogeochemistry, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, global freshwater use, land system change, biodiversity loss, atmospheric aerosol loading, that's the small particles in the atmosphere, and chemical pollution. If we look at each of those things, if the red wedge is within the green wedge, then we're still kind of okay. If the red wedge has exceeded the green wedge, that we've already exceeded what we think is a safe space for us to be operating in. And so what you can see is that in some of these areas we can't even measure it yet, some things like chemical pollution. But for those that we can measure, we've already exceeded in at least three areas, climate change, the biogeochemistry of the nitrogen cycle, in other words, putting um, fertilizer onto the land and so on, and global biodiversity loss. We've already exceeded what we think is a safe operating space. And so if you just look at one of those. All of these things, of course, have, have an impact on human health. So I'm just going to pluck out one for, for just a few moments to put a, a kind of a context, if you like, look at some of the links between climate change, which we think we've already exceeded, and the impacts that's having on human health. So if we look at the, the deaths attributable to climate change between the years 1970 to 2000, and, and each country there has been expanded to the size relative to the number of deaths, what you can see there is that we're already seeing major, impact, major health impacts of climate change. So things like malnutrition with 80,000 people, diarrhea 50,000, malaria 20,000, flooding 3,000. So we're already starting to see major impacts of climate change on health. And those impacts get felt through very complex pathways sometimes. So for example, if you look here, the, you've got climate change on one side and you've got health impacts on the other. It's not just a one-to-one -one relationship. So, for example, there are direct impacts of climate change, which are a kind of one-to-one -one relationship. So, climate change, if it gets hotter, more heat waves, more people die due to heat stress. That's a direct impact. But there are also many more indirect impacts. Because climate change affects these biophysical systems that we talked about. About glaciers, it affects river flows, ocean temperatures, pH, currents, sea level rise, nitrogen cycles, phosphorus cycles, soil health, forests, coastal zones, biodiversity, and those in turn influence you know, things like ecological changes, food yields, water quality, uh, mosquito populations, and so on. It affects impacts on social structures and economic structures through property damage, jobs, displacement, things like that, which also have health impacts. And then there are those ecological changes also will then also lead to further indirect impacts. So it's a very complex web of uh, causality from climate change through to impacts. We're just giving one very brief example here. Um, people just say, oh yeah, well, as the earth gets hotter, um, malaria will, will be able to be spread because the mosquitoes will have a, a larger range. It's not as easy as that. So that's, you know, that's the top line there. Climate change, temperature increases, that changes the microbial replication rate, and that leads through into, into infectious disease. But well, there are also many indirect paths through rainfall, surface water, that provides breeding grounds for, for mosquitoes. So that affects mosquitoes and ticks. Through the humidity, through uh, winds and dust drying, and then through also 
through things like undernutrition, social disruption and displacement, which changes exposure and vulnerability of populations. So it's not just a simple climate change, temperature, malaria or infectious disease. There's a, there is this complex web. And not only is it complex, but everything interacts with everything else. So just moving on now to the Sustainable Development Goals themselves. Currently, we have the Millennium Development Goals. They were agreed by the UN in the year 2000. They run until 2015, and they are very development-focused, and we'll look at them in a, in, a few, in a few minutes. But what the, um, what the UN agreed at the Rio Plus 20 Summit um, a year or so ago was that they actually want to change that paradigm a little bit when, they, when the 2015 uh, time comes around. So what they said was a number of things, and one of those was, we want to underscore that the Millennium Development Goals are a useful tool in focusing achievement of the specific development gains as part of a broad development vision and framework for the development activities of the United Nations, for national priority setting, and for mobilization of stakeholders and resources towards common goals. We therefore remain firmly committed to their full and timely achievement. So the first thing is they're not walking away from the Millennium Development Goals. Those Millennium those Development Objectives are still first and foremost. However, they also said, we further recognize the importance and utility of a set of sustainable development goals. The goals should address and incorporate in a balanced way all three dimensions of sustainable development, that's social, economic, and environmental. They should be coherent with and integrated into the UN development agenda beyond 2015, so they need to be integrated with the Millennium Development Goals. The development of these goals should not divert focus or effort from the achievement of the MDGs. But well, we underscore that the sustainable development goals should be action-oriented, concise, easy to communicate, limited in number, aspirational, global in nature, universally applicable to all countries, while taking into account different nationalities. And then after lunch, we'll do world peace and everything else. So it's a really big challenge. How do we integrate the development challenges that were articulated in the Millennium Development Goals with a sustainability concept? Care for the environment, care for society, well-being, all of those things. And as I said there, there are various models of sustainable development. One is the three pillars, economic, social, environmental. But one other model, which is kind of similar, is this one, where the three are nested. So in this model, the economy is in the center and it sits within society. So the economy net only exists to serve society, as opposed to being an independent a pillar on its own with an end as the outcome. Whereas often the economy is seen as, as the thing we're aspiring to, or we must grow our economy. Or well, why? We only grow our economy to serve society. So it sits within society. But society sits within that finite bounds of the environment. We have a limited environment. We only have a limited planet. So that society has to sit within them. So if we look at it in this nested way, and we look at how that's evolved over time, this is a kind of illustration. So in 1900, the economy was small because we had a very small population, very small society, and the natural environment was essentially infinite. So we were able to make development gains through exploitation of our world's natural resources. That was a perfectly legitimate thing to do. They were essentially infinite. We had coal reserves, oil reserves, everything else. And, and so what we did in, in, in our terms is we exchanged natural capital, in other words, the natural environment, for human and social capital, for how we develop as a society, including health gains. If you look at 1950, okay, things have grown a little bit, but still not too much. If you look how it is now, the, the society has grown, the economy has grown, and that is placing a clear stress on the natural environment. This is this Anthropocene that we're talking about. So, so we're here over on the right hand side. The problem is our mindset is still over on the left hand side. We're still looking to develop through exploitation of the world's natural resources and we can no longer continue to do that. And we're, we're starting to reach some of the limits about being able to do that. And I'll just show one very brief illustration. This graph shows income per head so, in other words, wealth, it's a measure of the economy, if you like, against life expectancy, which is a, a very imperfect and crude measure of, of health or well-being. And what you can see is that, sure enough, 
on the left hand side of the curve, these are the countries listed. The richer you get, the longer you live. That's what you would expect. That's what the, the paradigm is based on. The richer we all are, the healthier we are, the wealthier we are, the happier we are, the better everything is. And sure enough, on the left hand side of the curve, that's true. Until you have basic health care, basic education, basic shelter, food, water, energy, all of those basic requirements, that is true. But once you get to around about $10,000 per person annual income, that curve really levels off. And, and then real, you know, additional wealth gains really don't gain you anything in terms of life expectancy. In fact, if you look at some of the ones around about the $10,000 mark in places like Costa Rica and Cuba, they have a higher life expectancy than some of them are way on the far right hand side like the United States. Well, not always a very palatable message. Uh, and, and there is even a tendency now for, the, for that right hand side of the curve to actually start dipping down. And that's where some of those sort of first world health problems start to come in, in terms of obesity and diabetes and stress and so on. So it's not a simple relationship. So, these are the millennium development goals. So this is what we're trying to achieve in terms of our development. Ending poverty and hunger, universal education, promoting gender equality and empowering women, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, combating HIV, AIDS, malaria and other diseases, ensuring environmental sustainability and developing a global partnership for development. You'll notice that three of those are very health focused and we're not walking away from those. However, and the big however is that New research since these were agreed in 2000 shows that we need to have a stable functioning of the Earth system as a prerequisite for a thriving global society. So in other words, if we want to continue to develop as a society, if we want to continue to make health gains, we have to do that in the context of a thriving Earth system. Otherwise, development gains that we make by exchanging natural capital for more human and social capital will be undermined by the damage caused by the natural environment. So in other words, as we exploit the natural environment to get those health gains, more people will die because of the impacts of climate change through floods, through droughts, through heat waves, through dislocations, through, through refugees having to move because they can no longer grow food where they used to be able to grow food. So a lot of the, the development gains are put at risk because of the environmental damage that we're causing. So what we have to do is move the two forward at the same time. So what we did in a, in a paper that was published in Nature earlier this year was essentially twin those development objectives with what we call some sustainability objectives. And these are, uh, these are just, you know, they're, they're just examples, if you like. So we want to maintain a stable climate system, limiting global temperature increase to no more than two degrees reduce the rate of global biodiversity loss, safeguard ecosystem services, uh, maintain the capacity of the global and hydrological cycle to provide fresh water to sustain resilience of ecosystems, maintain well-functioning nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, maintain clean air for health and regional environments, sustainable and precautionary use of new entities, that sort of chemical pollutants and abiotic natural resources such as minerals and metals. And so then the idea is to combine the Millennium Development Goal objectives with the sustainable uh, sustainability objectives to produce a set of sustainable development goals that are integrate that integrate those two things. And several people, several groups around the world are trying to do that now to feed into the official UN process, which is to aim to agree these sustainable development goals by 2015 in order to start in 2016 with this new set of goals. And here's four different examples. I'll really just focus on the ones on the right hand side. Um, this is produced by the, what's called the High Level Panel of Eminent Persons, which is one of the groups that's been feeding into this process. And the thing about when you start to look at this in the context of health, is that all of these things relate to everything else, and all of these things relate to health. So if you look at them, end poverty, with clear links between poverty and health. Provide quality and lifelong education and learning, clear links between uh, the levels of education and people's levels of health. Empower girls and women to achieve gender equality. Clear links in terms of maternal health, uh, empowerment of women and, and health. Ensure healthy lives. That's the one goal that they suggested actually had, had health in them directly. How are they going to break down and ensure healthy lives? You know, then you have to start thinking what the targets might be. 
ensure food security and good nutrition, obviously. You know, <laughs> nutrition and, and health go, go hand in hand, as does universal access to water and sanitation. Water for drinking water, water for sanitation, and water to provide uh, irrigation for agriculture. Secure sustainable energy. Again, clear links to health through things like outdoor air quality, power stations emitting pollutants which cause local health, local health issues, but also indoor air quality, people burning wood and dung inside their homes, lots of particulates, lots of bronchial disease and so on. So producing clean energy, absolutely key to health. Create jobs, sustainable livelihoods and equitable growth. Hang up, having people who have a clear, clear link between um, you know, healthy jobs and, and healthy people. Ensure good governance and effective institutions, and that would include obviously health institutions. Manage natural resources and assets sustainably, well that's what I've already covered. Create a global enabling framework to catalyze long-term finance. We've got to be able to pay for these long-term health services, particularly when you think about an aging population, and a fraction of the population that's going to be you know, um, you know, of a senior age, when other people have actually got to pay for their, for their health care and ensure stable and peaceful societies. Again, obvious, you know, if you don't have peace and security, people die in wars and conflict and so on. And as I say, lots of groups have tried to come up with these. This is a sort of mud diagram of all of the different suggestions, suggestions and how often different suggestions of what should be in these goals have come up. And what you see is that just about the most popular one, not quite, but you know, health is right up there. So there is inevitably going to be health first and foremost first and foremost and front of centre in these sustainable development goals. The challenge will be how do we come up with targets for these health goals and how do we make sure that those targets are integrated with and are not undermined by the targets that we set and the goals that we set in other areas. Thank you. I've heard it said that climate change is the greatest threat facing humanity. Uh, I've also heard it said that development is the greatest threat facing humanity. Um, I would argue that trying to do both of those things at the same time is the greatest challenge facing humanity. So um, I hope this has been informative. Um, again, sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, now, having this panorama, we'll now pass the, the, the word or the microphone to Cornelia Uber, who works on the Institute of Peace and Development uh, at the University of Duisburg. And Cornelia will tell us a bit about the process. Considering all those complex issues, what is the response that the post-2015 development agenda is producing up to now? Cornelia. Thanks for being here. Um, and although the audience is considerably smaller than uh, in the morning, uh, I think some of you might have been in uh, the other sessions in the morning, because we already had a series of sessions on health in the post-2015 global development framework. Uh, but since I'm no expert on public health, or I'm not of a medical profession, but I'm a political scientist who is interested in, global, in, the, in the global negotiation processes, and how they may lead to consensual outcomes and how these outcomes might be translated into policy action, I hope I will be able to contribute um, a slightly different perspective to what you have already heard on health and development today. So what I'm going to do is um, to show you how what, or to show you what can be gained, or hopefully all of us can gain, um, I will do, I will highlight the difference of the post-2015 process to the MDG process by pointing out some of the essentials or maybe starting points of the current process, which is uh, why I will then shortly touch upon the process, uh, but only shortly, and just show you briefly two possible versions of an overarching goal. And then I'll try to present you my view on how a goal might be framed before I will then try to turn to some challenges uh, which make it difficult to, to devise a governance system for sustainable development. So, okay. Um, we have to bear in mind that 
this process is completely different to what we experienced with the MDG because it offers a new perspective on development. Although we will focus on the environmental dimension of it uh, in this panel, and you heard some of the environmental boundaries or planetary boundaries before, um, sustainable development is defined to have three dimensions, the economic, the social, and the environmental dimension. That means it challenges our notion of how development and growth as a means or as a prerequisite for development are defined. And this we have to keep in mind because this time development, sustainable development, not only relates to the global south, but also to us in the north. And this is why the post-2015 agenda must be relevant to all societies, not only to developing countries. Um, so the lessons we learned from the MDG process, the MDGs were terrific because they served as a kind of focal point around which different types of actors rallied uh, to tackle some problems. But with the MDGs came a kind of result-based result -based perspective, and this meant that indicators had to be developed, and I know there are people here who develop indicators even for the next phase of this post-2015 agenda, but these indicators had to be measure measurable on an aggregate level. What we learned from the MDG process is that national indicators mask existing inequalities within countries. And this is why the idea of equity has come to the fore in this process now. So when we look at the relationship between health and sustainable development, um, there are essentially three ways to frame this relationship. First of all, health is seen as contributor to the achievement of sustainable development goals. Uh, the second way to frame it is health as a potential beneficiary of sustainable development. This is what we already heard. And the third way to frame it is health as a way of measuring progress across all three pillars of sustainable development policy. Um, and I think some of my colleagues or co-speakers will uh, try to give you various ideas on how to measure uh, the progress. Um, when you look at the, at the process now, don't be shocked, maybe you can't read it properly, but I took this slide from, from an NGO, the Catholic Fund of Overseas Development. Um, I think it shows nicely <clears throat> how complex the process is. And when you compare it to the MDG, there are several anecdotes how the MDGs came about. Um, one is, for instance, and maybe this is the true version, I don't know, that Mark Mallock Brown, the then, the then uh, UND, head of UNDP, just took a couple of people down to a basement office um, at the UN headquarter in New York, and they came up with the MDGs. This is one version. Maybe everybody has a, has, a, has a different version. But what this shows, the slide shows, is that we have a completely different process now. It's an open process. It's not only an intergovernmental or interagency process. Um, there were, especially during 2012 and 2013, there were ongoing consultation processes with civil society organizations. There are a lot of avenues for civil society organizations to participate in this process. But now, when we enter the phase 2014 to 2015, it will be essentially a, an intergovernmental negotiation processes. process. It's not completely closed, but you have to keep in mind now it's up to the governments to decide. So therefore, it's essential to see where we are. Um, in May, the high-level panel um, um, published a report on a new set of goals that might um, be relevant for the next phase starting in 2015. Um, you heard there are 12, essentially 12 goals, and one goal uh, relates to health. It's to ensure healthy lives. 
And if you compare it with the MDGs, there were explicitly three MDGs that related to health, you see that they take up the old MDGs in some way. But we also have this different process, the Sustainable Development Goals process, um, which is essentially has been overtaken by uh, the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, this is assisted by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And this network um, has different thematic groups. The one on health for all came up with a report or a draft report, which is open for comment at the moment in September, in mid-September. And there was the goal, achieve health and well-being at all ages, with several other um, enabling goals as they call it. And one of the enabling goals, for instance, is universal health coverage. So um, we have to keep in mind there are several proposals for goals uh, now in, um, uh, which, which are at the basis of the intergovernmental negotiation process, which will start now. Um, but I think if you want to frame goals, you have to keep in mind that you should stick or you might stick, that would be my recommendation, to a rights-based or human rights-based approach. We already heard something of the different speakers here today. Why is it important to stick to this rights-based approach? We are, all, we are talking about holding actors accountable in this process. This was the function of the MDGs. Um, so you had a target, it was a measure, measurable, in, with measurable indicators, and actors could be held accountable. So um, if you have this rights-based approach, for, for instance, the Ghanaian Minister of Health just mentioned the brain drain. Uh, of uh, health personnel from developing countries to developed countries. There are rules for recruiting health personnel which are discussed uh, at WHO. So this might be a normative framework to tackle the problem of brain drain. Or for instance, um, we have different, um, as, as uh, Albrecht Jan this morning showed us, we have different human rights treaties, contracts, covenants, but th those treaties do hold state actors accountable. But we also have different means and instruments which are right, rights-based who also hold non-state actors accountable. For instance, we have the UN gu guidelines on business and human rights. These are voluntary standards, but nevertheless, there are out there and civil society organizations, for instance, can hold business actors accountable for polluting water in developing countries, for extracting, for doing dirty extractive, uh, for having dirty extractive, extractive industries in developing countries, for instance. We have some instruments, instruments and means out there, and if all the, the goals we, we are trying to devise now are based on rights or human rights, then we might have a normative framework which might make it easier to hold um, all the actors, state and non-state actors, accountable. So if you think about the overarching goal being health and well-being, then you have different health ch challenges through the life course. We had also discussions in various sessions about as adolescents, we have the problem of aging societies. So we have to look at different health challenges through the life course of people, not only communicable, and communicable but also non-communicable diseases. And we also heard today about the social determinants of health. These are already out there, and these might define or be reflected um, with the needs of populations, and that might lead, might lead to universal health coverage. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it, because we had, we had several speakers from the US um, in the program which couldn't show up because of the government uh, shutdown. The US government was shut down because um, some parts of the political system in the United Nations and even in the, in the uh, population think that's a 
violation of their basic rights if you have universal health coverage. So if this enters the intergovernmental process, I wouldn't bet on it that universal health coverage will be one of the prominent enabling goals. Interestingly, uh, it came uh, at the end of all the discussions, it, it seemed that even uh, that governments and non-governmental organizations seem to converge on universal health coverage. So this might be one way to frame it. So um, why is it, why will it be hard to translate this into policy action? Why do I come up with this slide of change landscape of global health financing? We were talking about holding uh, actors accountable. So if you look at this slide... Um, Cornelia, you have two minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost finished. So, what you see is that we have a number of new actors on the arena, on the global health arena. Uh, not only state actors, we have non-state actors like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have a number of public-private partnerships, Gavi being a very prominent one. Or we have new financing mechanisms like the Global Fund. And, but you see, there's a lot of money around, but who will decide on what the money will be spent for? And this is something you have to tackle with in a system of a global health system of governance. So, just to show you, just show you, and uh, my co speakers will try to um, be more explicit on the interrelations on the environment and the health system. What you see is that there are a number of interrelations or connections to other sectors. And health can be a contributor to the achievement of the sustainable development goals, but it can also benefit from other sustainable policy actions in different areas like environment, as we heard before, but even agriculture. Um, this is the, the question of food security. What is missing is a body who is in charge of spelling out all these interrelations or having them on the agenda. Maybe the high-level panel forum um, might be such a body. Um, Michael, one of my co-speakers, will tell you more about the high-level panel forum, which um, has been established at the UN level this year. Um, but still, this is an open question. What is clear is that another idea, just a panel, a panel on global health governance, a UN nationwide panel on global health governance or global health, wouldn't be enough just to have all the interrelations in mind. You need a more overarching body like, for instance, as I said, the high level panel forum. So, but this is something up to my co-speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornelia. It's a good question. What, who's, who's going to take that uh, responsibility? Uh, to make this more interactive, I think we're going to allow some uh, questions. If you have something now, for example, anybody who would like to pose a question to the minister or to Cornelia, please feel free. So we can start a dialogue. We're going to have more space for discussion afterwards, but if there's anybody in questions. Uh, Am I allowed? You, you can speak now. Well, um, since there was nobody from the audience, um, we had in 1992 the Sustainable Development Agenda, and now we are talking about sustainability as if it was a new invention that fell from the heavens. What is different? To whom? <laughs> Yeah, in 1992, uh, you know, heads of states uh, met in um, Rio. Uh, we spelled out uh, the agenda for sustainable development. But I think that uh, you know what is missing is uh, sometimes uh, heads of governments, you know, presidents, you know, meet, you know, at a high level, uh, you know, conference, and they make commitment. But then there's no follow-up. You know, we don't define the strategic plan to achieve uh, the decisions uh, of the heads of state. So I think that maybe that is why she's asking 
that after we know that uh, there is uh, a, a definite program for sustainable development that came out from the Rio conference, you know, setting up the high level panel, you know, of uh, commissioners. But now, you know, what is happening? So in her opinion, do we need a new, you know, global health governance system? So I think there must be, uh, you know, some continuity uh, from the heads of states, uh, you know, pronouncement to a technical group so that uh, we can speed up, you know, the declarations that come out from these international conferences. And I don't know whether you like to. Yeah, I, I think essentially it's, a, it's what has changed could be looked at in two levels. One is the level of the threat or at least the recognition of the level of the threat. And that was very much captured in David Griggs's comments um, about planetary boundaries. You can agree or disagree with the planetary boundaries or the metrics chosen, but what you can't disagree with is the fact that there's a, a limited space for, 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 for human existence. And I think also what has changed is the recognition of complexity, the reality of that um, all the factors which might be relevant to this problem interrelate to one another in a very complex way, which makes the situation very complex, the, the remedy likely to be complex, but not necessarily impossible. And honestly, I think the MDGs were missing on a policy level because the MDGs showed us that we can, be, because we're not talking about sustainable development as such, but we're talking about sustainable development goals now. And this is the momentum in the discussion that we just, we frame it according to the MDG discussion and what we did and we have a lot of new actors we have a lot of new money in the system and and this makes it easier on the policy level because there's this momentum of the mdgs and the post 2015 debate about what are we going to do and this is the window of, of, of opportunity that opened up for the sustainable development debate and i'm really happy about it that it that it just is reinvigorated now but it's a completely different framework now. Super. Uh, Reiner, can I invite you now to, to address the, the group? Professor Reiner Sarbon is the director and the chair of the Institute of Public Health University of Heidelberg. He's also the co-chair of health for the International Panel of Climate Change. And he has a number of other things in his CV. Uh, we're very pleased to have him now addressing some of those connections on, with public health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ditlev, for inviting me. And thank you for holding out at this late hour. I want to link, as everybody told us to do, different sectors that haven't been together very often around health. And that is non-communicable diseases, climate change, and economic productivity. Rare bedfellows, I must say. So let's see what the link is, and hopefully this is arousing your interest a little bit. I think it ties in very nicely to what the minister said about the high cost of NCDs, what uh, Professor Griggs said about the boundaries of existence of our humanity, and also what you said about the uh, process and the aims of the, of the sustainable development goals. Now, this is straight from the IPCC. I take some pictures from the current IPCC Working Group 1, the scientific basis. This is from the Working Group 2, the summary for policymakers. And it shows that uh, it's a very um, enlightened process. They are not climate gurus sitting there and modeling something and forgetting about social determinants and so forth. So you see here, up there, the climate change. This is physics. Here you see the socioeconomic. Uh, development and uh, then you see all these things that have been mentioned so far and it, it becomes convoluted and I put health right in the middle that's the only addition that I did to this slide so uh, this is the kind of nexus that we are talking about and we cannot simplify it it's just there so whenever I talk about climate change and health and not all the others forgive me you cannot handle the human brain cannot handle complexity simultaneously so let's see uh, this is from a WHO publication. You know, NCDs have a long way from, from risk factor accumulation along the life course to uh, manifest disease. And you see here environmental risk factors. 
And I think uh, we should add another risk factor now, and this is climate change. Two NCDs, which is rare, because most people talk about malaria and about malnutrition, diarrhea, but NCDs is what I'm uh, proposing to you is another one. So this is the world we should live in by the end of the century, and this is the world we might be living in, very inhospitable, at the four-degree world, and this is the two-degree world, and we have to decide. So economic, environmental risk factors, and this is climate change. This is what I'm going to talk about. You've seen similar graphs uh, before. Uh, the climate is uh, projected to change. This is temperature. And you see uh, there the old, this is in black, the old scenarios, which the IPPC used, you see in black. And then the new ones, uh, which I'm not going into uh, to describe, are uh, in red, and you see, if anything, the trend is corroborated and even spread. So if we are living in the, in the wrong world, it's our world, we chose to, it's the 8.5 watt per square meters world, which goes up to four and a half degrees. And this is what the World Bank uh, published in Turn the Heat Down, the four degree world. There were conferences on this, so I'm not scaremongering. This is an option or a possibility if we do not uh, mitigate. And I put a line here. This is what everybody from all sectors agreed in, in Copenhagen, COP17, uh, I think it was 17, on the two degree level. That's what probably the sectors can cope with. Humanity and biosphere can cope with. Think about two. So, here's what I want to talk about, and I want to focus it a little bit. Non-communicable diseases, climate change, what's the link? Now I make it simpler, even more simple. I take climate change, I say heat stress. I only look at heat stress. And I look at health and the work productivity of poor populations work productivity of uh, poor quality, and leave the non-communicable diseases. So that's what I'm going to talk about. This gentleman in uh, Costa Rica is cutting sugar cane. He does this in plain, in, in plain uh, at, in, at sunlight, and he can't do this at midday anymore because of the heat, and I will talk about this. So people who are forced to work outside, most of the time in poor countries and poor people, they are forced to expose themselves to the elements. And one of the major conditions is temperature. So how does climate change percolate through the system to create NCDs? This is a complicated slide. Uh, please visit it uh, on the website. Basically, no, I shouldn't point at the screen there. Basically, you have heat exposure here at its simplest. You have heat stress, dehydration, kidney disease, cardiovascular and respiratory distress. These are the NCDs, and that leads to health effects and to work capacity effects. Of course, it's not as simple as that, because there's also air pollution that conjures with heat stress and so forth. But let's take it simple. This is the pathway that we are, we are talking about, where this is uh, the one I'm focusing on, although it's all linked a little bit. For example, the injuries due to um, heat waves. Anyways, sorry, this is not to, um, to over-stress <laughs> you at this hour. It just shows a, a really simple, if I can understand it, you can understand it. So what we have here is the metabolic rate. This is now giving up. Oh, no. It's a metabolic rate. And maybe I should have a mic because this is an angle that you can really not operate at. So you have the metabolic rate and then you have your movement, your work. So you can't, uh, you, the only thing you can do is go down to your metabolic rate, stop working. And that's what most people do in, in these environments. Then there's a complicated equation, sweating and all this. And the main thing is S, accumulation of heat in the body. That's when your body temperature rises. This is physiology, nobody can uh, challenge this. So these two, if you want to avoid, and everybody does this spontaneously, if you want to avoid overheating with all the health consequences, you stop moving, and that means you stop producing if you're a construction worker, if you're a traffic policeman, if you're working in a non-air-conditioned factory. 99% of low-income country factories are non-air-conditioned. And this is the hard truth. Torch Hellström is the champion of this. You know, it goes very steep. This is what you can do, 
at certain degrees of a special temperature, which is the human stress index. Um, so if you move one, one degree, you may lose 40% of production. Keep that curve in mind. It's a, it's a mind-boggling curve. So we are not talking about, oh, maybe two degrees, oh, maybe three degrees. It matters. And this is hard work. It starts very early already, at 27 degrees, to force you to reduce your work output. And this is mild work. And this is a construction work in India. So what people do, they come at 4 o'clock in the morning, before dawn, and start working. And then they stop at 11 and they pick up again at 4. They work also, they output less, they ruin their family life, and they, they can't do this uh, sustainably, because uh, they cannot work at night, at night at all. Now, what is this index, which is the wet bulb globe temperature, for those who want to get into this? It is a measure of human stress. It's also wind, it's also uh, convection, it's also humidity. So if it's be above A, it starts getting bad. It's the mild work that's suffering. Uh, it's the hard work that's suffering. And here's already the mi mild work that's suffering. So here is today, 2050, in the shade, in the sun, many people have to work in the sun. And you see it's only until 2050. I could show you much redder graphs uh, if you go until the end of the century. So there is a big problem in Cambodia, in Indonesia, in India, in sub-Saharan Africa, I'm afraid to say. Um, so farmers, construction workers, everybody who works outside, everybody who works in, a, in an industry, in a sweatshop, is affected by this combination. So here I show you the health impacts, and then I show you the economic impacts, and then I finish. So to prevent any interaction from that. Uh, so health impacts. So what if it gets hot and hot and hot? What NCDs uh, and what other diseases do we have to expect? Here you have, is it an NCD? Is it an injury? or is it infectious disease? And just by eyeballing, you see that half of them are infectious, half are NCDs. Don't quote me on this, but that's roughly the, the size of the problem. Everybody talks only about the infectious disease and the malnutrition part. So heat exhaustion at work in daily life, NCD, direct. All these are direct because of the heat. Accidents, heat exhaustion, injuries. Heat effect on people with NCDs, if I have diabetes, if, I have, if I'm on drugs for hypertension, I cannot use my musculatory system and sweating doesn't work. So all these are effects that nobody, I asked my colleagues from diabetes, they didn't know. So this is a, a, an orphan topic and I hope that some of the younger ones and, are getting into this and, and look into this in terms of doctoral thesis or so. Heat stroke and death, injuries, drowning due to floods, sea level rise, injury direct, lung and heart disease combining with air pollution, uh, so obstructive pulmonary disease, NCD, diarrheal disease, ID, malnutrition, it's both, you know that malnutrition is also caused by infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, we know, mental health, environmental refugees in Australia, people commit suicide when they have to leave their land, and also in Africa, there are also reports on this, so we are talking about mental health consequences. Productivity loss, Less than 1% of factories are air-conditioned. Agriculture and outside work is fully, workers are fully exposed, there's no way. I mean, in America they have air-conditioned tractors, yeah, but it's not an option. Only the very rich household live in air-conditioned houses. So the productivity loss, and that is something one, one really has to, to consider, is between 11.4 and 26.7% in South Asia. One billion people, Central America and the Caribbean, in non-protected workplaces, which is roughly 80%. So this is a very stern reminder that we have this link between non-communicable diseases and direct heat as a proxy for climate change and productivity loss. And this is my last slide. Uh, this is a shoe factory worker. No, it's a yes, a shoe factory worker. It's a picture also by Tor Chelstrom. And she has, in addition to the stress in her non-air-conditioned factory room, she wears a mask because she has solvents. Shoes or electronics, they have solvents, they have things that get 
easily solved when it gets hotter. So she has the additional risk of toxicity, which is increasing with heat. So there's another unknown in the health equation with non-communicable diseases and climate change. And with this, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have space for one brief question. Thank you. I'm, I'm exploiting my, my position up here for asking a question. Um, this is very interesting material that, that you found here. And I was just wondering, did you also have a chance to look at known heat waves that we have witnessed in the past couple of years? And I especially remember the heat wave in Russia in 2010. And the official death toll of this heat wave, I don't know if it's known here, is 55,000 people. I uh, was just wondering, do you have any information on what these people died from, actually? Well, uh, I have more information on the French and the European uh, uh, heat wave. Most of the 47,000 people who died in France were uh, urban, urban heat island effect, another, at another 1.5 degrees, and were living upstairs where the poor people live, not on the ground floor. And I don't know how this works out in, in uh, low-income countries, but that's where people work, students and old people. And it was 80% of old people who died. So talking about uh, inequities in, in this, even in climate impact, you have inequities in impact. And they died. Uh, there's, there's no uh, official statistics, but what, they, what researchers have tried to figure out afterwards, that they died of heat stroke, dehydration, renal complication, and then the lack of help. I mean, they just couldn't move, and they, they desiccated. So, so, I mean, they got completely dry. So it's very sad to, to hear the story. Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the professor whether he also considered that uh, the increase in temperature is also affecting uh, the you know, melting of the ice uh, from the you know, Arctic. And the melting of the ice is also increasing, uh, you know, the sea level. And uh, the sea level rise is uh, creating these uh, tropical storms. And also, you know, a lot of the landslides and the floods and coastal erosion that uh, we are experiencing in uh, most countries and how, you know, communities are displaced because of uh, the sea level rise, you know. Thank you for the question. I must say something because I've, I've uh, given an answer to a similar question before and people said, oh, how do you know that climate change did uh, Katrina or something, a hurricane? It's like with you die of uh, lung cancer and uh, then I say, well, you smoked, but then somebody else said, but he also uh, lived in an in a air polluted environment. It's multifactorial, but it's clear that statistically there is an increase in the severity and the frequency of these uh, extreme weather events. There's a whole um, volume of IPCC on this, the extreme weather events. And the sea level rise is already, that was one of the key points in the first report, the scientific basis, that it's now approaching one meter. And that sounds little, but it means that any storm surge starts at one, higher, one meter higher. And if you look at Bangladesh, is vast areas below sea level. And they can't put dikes like Holland. So you see the impact. And you should know that 40% of mega cities are at the ocean. So uh, all this militates to mitigate, to make sure that this doesn't happen, that we don't end up in this 8.5. Pardon me. Maybe the president <laughs> used his power. <laughs> But I was finished. I was finished. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think this is a very good segue to uh, Professor George Morris, who comes from the um, Center for, the European Center for Environment and Human Health at the University of Exeter in the UK, and who has a special interest on seaside issues to do with health and environment and border and coastal areas. Uh, George wants to focus on some of the methodologies because. As you remember, we have the role and the job here of coming up with some quantification of environmental health impacts in the uh, for health gains of sustainable development. So, George, over to you. Uh, th thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's um, a real pleasure to be here and a pleasure for me to listen to the other speakers because 
I suppose they, they together they've emphasised probably the, the, the biggest thing about this from my point of view as a science policy advisor in, in government is that this is an issue of huge complexity. It's going to be a, a social challenge, an economic challenge, and, and a wider societal challenge. And we really have an option here. We either say we're going to be overwhelmed by the complexity of this, or we start to develop tools which will allow us to navigate within that complexity, however crude those might be. And that's really what I want to, to talk about just now. But first of all, I want to just make an observation about public health. Um, public health has always been built on shifting foundations. It's a core notion of public health that um, change is part of it. And, and Public health practitioners and, and scientists and all those who collectively are involved in the business have to vary their approaches as circumstances dictate. It sounds like a statement of the obvious, but I think we need to remember that we have done things like this in the past and we'll need to do them in the future. A good way to think about this is in terms of transitions. Um, the idea that we're building health and well-being on the basis of a range of transitions that, that shift those foundations. And there are, the, the minister mentioned an urban transition, this move of people towards cities. We've seen uh, certainly in, in Western Europe a demographic transition, an aging population. And those, all these things change the context in which we have to deliver health. But I want to talk a wee bit about the environmental transition, which is the one which is, uh, on which I've been involved most of what I laughingly call my career, and um, I would continue to, to regard as, as very important. We started with an environmental conceptualization of public health. My view is we need, to, we need to return to one. So let's look at this relationship between environment and public health. A very classic model is that we have some sort of environmental hazard that translates through an exposure into diminished health outcome, and that might be infectious or it might be toxic, but nonetheless, it's still, still very very important for most of the world. But it is nonetheless simplistic, and we might begin to think nowadays that perhaps it's not just about environments being hazardous, it's also about the capacity of environments to nurture better and more equal health. So that would be a better model. Um, we would then have to say that, recognize that the transition from any environmental state, hazardous or positive, through an exposure to an outcome is mediated hugely by context, and that's why environmental health can be an inequalities issue. Why environment is such an inequalities issue is because those very social, economic, etc., factors either impede or lubricate that transition from an environmental state through to a health outcome. And indeed, the influence whether or not people having been exposed may go on to develop a, a, a health effect from it. So that's a more, a clearer representation. Here's another one, simply recognizing that the environment doesn't emerge from nowhere. There are social, cultural, behavioral, economic drivers, in other words, anthropogenic drivers that change that environmental state in, in, in health relevant ways. And just to complete the picture, clearly from a policymaker's point of view, if we want to influence that progress, we can impact anywhere on that chain and we can also impact on the context. And anything goes because it's not going to be easy and we need to think about all of those things. But despite the fact that those kind of perspectives raise the importance of environment as a determinant of health in a complex modern world. They simply are not enough. And they're not enough for all the reasons we've heard about, um, particularly from uh, David Griggs, but, but, but also from others. And that's because we're now beginning to change the environment. We saw the, um, the planetary boundaries being shown, and you can, as I said in my answer to the question earlier on, we can argue with the, the metric, but we can't argue with the principle that we are actually living beyond our means in terms of the planet. We can talk about um, Earth overshoot day, when the point in the year when we've used up the resources and we start to go into deficit. I believe it's now about August and creeping forward in the year. So. And this is, so the state of the environment is going to change and it will change in the future. And this is ultimately connected to health and well-being. These points have been made. But what it means is that if we're going to rethink things as a society, which is absolutely what we must do, we can no longer consider health 
well-being, equality, or even health services without thinking about the environment. And hence, I think we need to return to an environmental conceptualization of public health, which we had moved away from. And I believe that environmental conceptualization is probably best expressed by a term that's gaining some currency now, originally coined, I think, by Rayner and Lang um, at City University, but others could lay claim to that, and I've certainly been involved in talking about these things. But ecological public health is really about pursuing health and well-being on ecological principles. We can do no other thing because it, it's, it's later than we think effectively. Ecological public health is different because it posits that human social ecology, the kind of complexity of that interaction of social and behavioral and economic factors, is inextricably bound up with natural ecology and there is a dynamic interaction between the two. Human beings some point, probably around the, the European Renaissance, began to regard themselves as rather above the environment, separate from the environment, distinct from the environment, and we're being brought home to realize now that this is not really a, a tenable view. And unlike previous expressions of environment and health, such as the ones I spoke about, environment's no longer an out there. It's no longer something we as human beings react to. It's something we are part of, and we must shape our, our policies to, to do that. Um, it's different because it reminds us that we can't just simply plunder the, the earth with, um, indefinitely because natural systems underpin all life. Statement of the obvious, but we seem to be able to operate without um, embracing or internalizing that. And it doesn't retreat from complexity. There are no pump handles in this story. You know, that, that's a reference to something which I won't go into at the moment. Um, EPH um, demands that we integrate environment and natural ecology. And there's a, a model, again, borrowed from Rainer and Lang, which just illustrates this perfectly, that human health is inextricably bound up in, in ecosystems health. And any other interpretation is just to, to to deny the reality. But, and the, the good but here is that I think there is a conceptual bridge which will help us in policy. It's been mentioned already by one of the speakers or the panelists, and that is ecosystem services. Those are the goods that we get, the good things, the benefits we as human beings get from natural ecosystems. And ecosystem services were largely created as environmental scientists tried to take a sort of more anthropocentric slant on what they did, and they are largely not talked about in public health, but they need to be talked about in public health. Sorry about the complexity of this, but it touches on another thing. The Millennium Ecosystems Assessment said that there were four types of ecosystem services. Provisioning, the type of things we get from the environments, the products, food, fresh water, etc. Regulating climate change, Food, food regulation, water purification, cultural things. Those are the in inspiration we would get from environment, very important for mental health and well-being. And those are underpinned by supporting services, the basic photosynthesis, photosynthesis nutrient recycling, nutrient cycling, etc. But what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment added to this debate was they, they identified five ways in which those things translated to human well-being. One by deny, damaging our health in a direct way. One through undermining human security. If you live in a turbulent world, you can't have security. Material minima, we don't get the goods from the environment, and we don't get freedom of choice, and we don't get the social relations. And Carlos mentioned that I'm interested in ocean systems. And if you think, if you undermine a marine ecology, destroying coastal fishing communities, you hit every one of these, every one of these mechanisms. And it's illustrated that ecosystem services are the conceptual bridge that we probably need. Well, so what I'm really saying is that I showed you a red model. I would call that the proximal model of environmental health, which is the one we've operated in. And we can make it more and more sophisticated and we'll be better at doing it. But unless we recognize there is also a distal route from human from human activity to health and well-being, one that passes through ecosystems, we are not framing the problem with reference to all the factors that bear upon it, and we will get the wrong answers, and we are on a very dangerous trajectory. So a proximal route, but also a distal route, which recognizes that we pass through ecosystem services, but whether or not we experience the damage 
which comes to our health from those ecosystems is again going to be predicated on a context which is social and behavioral. This is what I mean by tools to think with. We need tools to think with that make us think around both those routes to human health. And if we don't, we're, we're only representing half the problem. So in conclusion, what I want to say is there are five areas I think are, are important here. One is issue framing which is what I've talked about there. We need to have holistic issue framing, simple tools to think with, to communicate, to gather our information. We need new ways with evidence. Um, randomized control trials aren't going to cut it in this, in this world. Ethics, you, you, you need ethics to tell you when to act when the information is not as good as you might wish it to be. We need the infrastructure, educational, institutional, and indeed physical to deliver, and we need governance. People have spoken a lot about governance um, today, and I think if we gather all those things together and regard those as the pillars under which we might act, then we'll begin to face up to this problem in a logical way, which doesn't oversimplify it, but recognizes its complexity, but it's also the fact that it might be solved. So thank you very much. Thank you, George, for in starting more on the tools. And I think we'll complete with the tools from uh, uh, Michael Kalmus, who's from the International Federation of Medical Students Association. And he's been very much hands-on the tools which are being used or trying to be used or attempted in the context of post-2015. Okay. Over to you, and then we have a few minutes for, for discussion. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is um, some of the possible ways and things that we can do to move forward with this. It's, we are aware of the impact links between climate and health, but how do we tie it to the political reality what structures are out there that we can input into and actually use these relationships that we're getting deeper understanding of um, to actually change policy. So this was how the Rio Plus 20 outcome document viewed health, um, and they looked at sort of health as a precondition, an outcome, and an indicator of all three pillars or areas of sustainable development. And Rio Plus 20, well, when I left it, I was uh, slightly disappointed at the end of the summit, uh, I must admit. Um, I was a slightly naive 22-year-old um, who'd never really been involved in the United Nations before. Um, and because I'd hoped that there would be a whole set of sustainable development goals coming out of Rio. But instead, as is tends to happen in the United Nations, we got agreements to create agreements. Um, and some of these have actually been moving forward and there has been some progress on some of these. And I'm gonna talk in a bit more detail about a couple of them. So we have the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. This has become the heart of the post-2015 process and I'll talk about a few possible ways that health can interact with what's going on there. The High Level Political Forum for Sustainable Development, kind of building on what um, was said earlier about sort of new governance structures for looking at the complexity and interrelations between sustainable development. There are a number of other ones, including looking at alternatives to general GDP and also looking at methods for um, promoting sustainable consumption and production patterns. So a bit about the High Level Political Forum. This is probably, in terms of institutional governance that came out of Rio, the big thing. And it, was, it had its first meeting earlier this year. It's the replacement to the UN Commission on Sustainable Development. And it has a very unique structure, which allows for a lot of input from those in civil society, including those in the health community, if they choose to use it. It's under both the UN General Assembly, which, as some of you may know, has no modalities or methods for civil society to input into it. And it's also under the UN's Economic and Social Council, which has relatively strong methods for civil society to input. And, one of, and some of its key out outcomes that is mandated to do is basically produce a global sustainable development report, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and also to undertake regular reviews of the implementation of both voluntary commitments and also the post-2015 goals. So this really is the heart of the accountability mechanism for what replaces the MDGs. This is where governments are going to be discussing this reviewing progress, and to a certain extent, civil society and those in the health community can hold them to account for this. So we need to really start thinking about how health could feature in this. How can we make sure that these health indicators that we're starting to talk about now can actually make sure that they're front and center being used to actually say, governments, you're not delivering on what your promises are. Okay, so one of the kind of major things that it's gonna produce is a global sustainable development report. And now I know a number of you here probably are thinking, oh, this is another UN report, uh, enough of those. Um, 
And in some ways, that might be the case, but there are some unique things about this report. In terms of reporting on sustainable development, there are a multitude of reports. There's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there's the GEO report from UNEP, there's the report of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and there's all kinds of reporting mechanisms that are reporting on this. And the whole aim of this thing is to produce something that is useful for policymakers, that draws together on some of those reports and doesn't actually duplicate their work. And they've actually produced an illustrative example of it. And health featured quite strongly, which considering that actually, if you look at the list of UN agencies that were associated with developing this report, the WHO didn't feature there, um, so they kind of saw that health was important to this. And that's possibly a promising sign because governments, are, those in, involved in sustainable development are starting to see the relationships. However, a kind of caveat of this was it was very much in terms of looking at reporting on MDG type things, so maternal and child health, and not so much looking at the interconnectedness between environment and health and sustainability and health. And another unique thing about this report, and something that offers a really good opportunity for those in the public health community, is that it's trying to draw on new science and new methods of working. It's utilizing crowdsourcing rather than the sort of standard peer review academic journals. That means that um, scientists in low income settings, including public health scientists, can feed into this. And I think for those of us in this room, we really need to support them in feeding in their science and their views into what will become the seminal report on progress on sustainable development. The other area it's responsible for, and I don't want to talk too much about um, the post-2015 goals because we've had that talked about earlier, is looking at voluntary commitments. Now, like it or not, we're not going to get something that is legally required for governments to do out of a lot of this. The Millennium Development Goals were not legally binding, and the same is true for a lot of other aspects of sustainable development. But what we can do is we can use these processes to kind of galvanize action and get people to make progress on these issues. So RIA Plus 20 established a uh, Sustainable Development in Action Registry, where over 1,400 commitments were registered on actions relating to sustainable development. And these came from everywhere, from cities through to um, uh, businesses to NGOs. These were people all committing to undertake things. And I think it reflected a sort of impatience with the lack of uh, legal frameworks, the fact that people wanted to get on and do things now to improve sustainable development. And given that also that cities are becoming kind of the heart of uh, where people are living, you know, 70% of the population by 2050 will live in cities, um, perhaps we need to start looking at these voluntary commitments as something that were initially overlooked at Rio and start going, how can we use health to actually galvanize people to um, make commitments to achieve things? And also then how can we also measure health outcomes to actually review uh, whether progress is being made. Can we do that? Is that possible? Can some of the health indicators that are being developed done that? Do that. So this is an example of how um, some work done by the Natural Resources Defence Council and the Stakeholder Forum in the UK. Um, and this is an example of reviewing some specific promises that came out of RIA Plus 20. They're not specifically health ones. Um, but they basically reviewed progress and they looked at a number of things such as transparency, is progress underway, and then ranked it on a sort of scoring system from basically two points to no points, and then decided to decide whether we were on track to meet that commitment. Now, the usefulness of these kind of um, mechanisms is that basically we can go take a commitment that has relevance to health, and we can actually publish this in these same spaces, uh, you know, on, in the high-level political forum and things, and actually say, that you can use these mechanisms to say, are we on progress or not? Can we measure a health outcome of a voluntary commitment? Can we measure a commitment that a city has made to make itself more sustainable and whether it's actually improved health? And then can we actually publicly display that information? And is there other ways of using new technologies and big data to actually make this relevant to policymakers so that they can actually, and also civil society, to hold people accountable? The next area I wanted to go on to is some opportunities within the green economy. Real Plus 20 was meant to chart the path to a green economy. Now, there's no real collective definition of what this is, but I think we here all know, and as has been mentioned earlier, planetary boundaries are kind of the heart of what's going to be a green economy. At the end of the day, whether we have green growth or a steady state economy or even degrowth, at the end of the day, we have to operate within planetary limits. Um, and we need to think about where health ties in here because the discussions around green growth and for example the global green growth institute um, 
is actually mostly talking about things such as natural capital accounting and basically looking at opportunities to um, predominantly to monetize um, ecosystem services and what the environment offers. But they're not particularly looking at health and well-being. And there's a couple of opportunities here that I think are really important to touch on and think about how the health community can input into them. The first of them is the 10-year framework on sustainable consumption and production. This was something that was developed by the UN Environment Programme and endorsed in Rio and is, is starting off this year. And part of its mandate is that it actually has to demonstrate tangible social benefits for sustainable consumption and production patterns. And in the work on health indicators for sustainable development goals, there has been some sort of looking at how unsustainable patterns of consumption, for example, in nutrition, unsustainable patterns of consumption of meat impact on health. And we can demonstrate social well-being from these things. And in fact, the whole aim of sustainable consumption and production to counter, to counter its critics who are saying the West are using environment to suppress growth is that we have to demonstrate social benefits to these things. The other big area is the alternatives to G EDP, and there's a whole load of work on this that's going on um, in the United Nations Statistical Commission, and you can read up more about that, but only to say that well-being and health metrics can play a key role in this, and I think the health community haven't really engaged with that, so that, therefore, it's mostly been economists and those involved in measuring natural capital and not social capital. Mike. Half a minute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sure. So I'll just wrap up here just to say a couple of opportunities that are coming up for the health community um, in the kind of thing. There's a number of open working group meetings. These are the, as I said, the heart of the post-2015 process and that we really need to have people in the health community attending these meetings and putting forward ideas, putting forward indicators um, on, and also practical solutions that tie these things to health and well-being, particularly around areas such as means of implementation, you know, trade, technology transfer, and tying these to health, um, because these are the real sticking points in these negotiations, and that's something that's not actually um, had much progress. And at the end of the day, if the sustainable development goals are to be successful, then the meth means are required for them to be implemented, and therefore there does need to be the linkage with health, which is rather less controversial topics there to um, move things forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've covered an enormous ground. Thank you, Mike. An enormous ground from the big qu uh, questions which are in the minds of a, a bright minister and an experienced minister to the practical experience of public health, to the methods, to the tools, to where the governance mechanisms are. So we turn to the audience now for your wisdom on the issues that we're just covering, considering that we want to get to accountability mechanisms, to metrics, and we want to hone in on a few issues. We cannot do everything, but you know, what are the big things that we should be going for in terms of health, sustainability, economics in, in development? Over to the audience, please. Good afternoon, I'm Renzo Guinta from the Philippines. Uh, thank you to our speakers for laying down the frameworks and context and mechanisms that govern uh, the ongoing discourse in development. But my question is more on the practical side, especially for negotiations and policy making. Uh, and I know that WHO has done uh, some work on the health co-benefits of climate change mitigation. I'm wondering if that could also be and should be done for the wide range of uh, candidate goals, whether for sustainable development goals or uh, the post-2015 goals. Um, I laud the efforts of the global health community in ch rallying around universal health care as the health goal, but we know that we need to look at the other goals if they are detrimental or promotive of health. So we need the health case probably for each of them, and that is, I'm not implying a healthization of sustainable development, but rather it's a good tool for us to negotiate better for health, uh, to monitor the impact of all these thematic goals on health, and also it's basically health in all policies in practice at the global level. So, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Sounds like a good question. I mean, we are for both things, of course for universal health coverage, but the big sort of gap, if anything, is on that exactly, on, the, on those aspects. How is that we relate to, inform to policies of the sectors? Does one, anyone want to speak? Are there any other questions from the audience? Perhaps you, we could sort of give you a bit more time. 
to, to put issues up, please. And then we can respond in, in turn. Thank you all for your uh, very insightful presentations. My name is Abdullah Saleh. I'm a general surgeon from Canada, uh, or at least finishing my training in general surgery. Um, with, with the priorities expressed, and I think with the climate change, I think the focus on non-communicable disease is key, but I suspect that moving forward, if we don't make trauma and injury a separate category that won't be clumped in with the non-communicable diseases, um, I think we'll be doing ourselves a disservice, particularly economically. When with climate change pushing urbanization, there's going to be an increase with, of course, the number of motor vehicles and hence the loss of usually the most productive member in a family. So not just because I'm from general surgery and hence trauma as a focus, but and from Canada where it's so cold that we have to keep moving, otherwise we'll, we'll not be productive. But hopefully the next World Health Summit 2014 might have a bigger focus on, on trauma and injury. Thank you. Very good. So unless there's a, another urgent question, we'll go through responses. Cornelia, ladies first. Um, you were asking about co-benefits of uh, other goals to health. And I think the, the process is underway. As I understood, there are several papers of the WHO focusing, for instance, on energy. Um, I, I, at the beginning, I, I thought I would be able to show more of the unifying potential of health, as I um, term my, my talk. Um, and I think you're right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a healthization of the discussion, but you see, when you take health and health benefits into account, for instance, with food, with water, sanitation, energy, whatever, then it becomes obvious that health is very important. And I think the process will show that more and more health gains will become explicit. Um, I agree with that. Health co benefits are kind of important in all the other goals. And the good thing about health is it's not fundamentally a controversial thing. The Republican Party aside, most people um, don't actually disagree with the idea of making people healthier. What they disagree around is environment and economic policy and other things like that. And the other good thing is that Actually, governments in New York, we did a survey, and we're going to be presenting the results of that tomorrow, um, of negotiators at the Open Working Group on how they perceived health. And actually, the majority of them did see the connection, uh, when we asked them whether they saw the connections between health and various other issues, including climate change and stuff, they did see those connections. What they wanted to see was then practically, okay, what does that look like? What would a tangible health indicator look like. And there has been some great work done. There is some good stuff on the WHO website um, in terms of the health and the green economy um, documents and things out there. But there is still work to be done to show what that would practically look like, because that's what they want to see. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree essentially with all of that. And, and really that the, the big gap here is getting some sort of health relevant metrics of of, of ecosystem damage and making those into our indicators. And uh, Michael has said that there is good stuff out there, but we need to agree on a set of these things. And just in terms of the other question about splitting trauma from NCDs, I think really any way that we can make this seem important to, to people in all constituencies and is, is fair game. So um, yes, absolutely, if, that, if that's helpful and that makes people see the, 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 the threat that we're under from what we're doing to the planet. Just a quick response to our friend from Canada, the surgeon, of course, uh, injuries and NCDs require completely different uh, public health responses. And so I, I, I am completely in agreement that this should be treated differently. Of course, you know the special report on extreme events by the IPCC is a wonderful collection also on the health side of uh, measures to prevent, to, to monitor, to surveil, if that's an English word, the um, possibility of extreme events and, and to have a community that responds. Minister, can you give us the last Final word. wisdom? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's been quite an uh, interesting uh, uh, section. But at least uh, what I can say is that uh, the evidence is clear. You know, it has uh, you know, scientifically you know, proven 
that uh, climate change does affect you know, health through sustainable development. And the evidence is also clear that as policy makers, we have to be committed to decisions and also to make sure that uh, sustainable development will be the core if we have to make policies or take decisions. Because uh, from Australia, we know that uh, the space is small, you know, the boundaries are limited, and that we cannot you know, measure economic growth, you know, fast economic development, and retarding the knowledge of uh, sustainability. So this is very important uh, for health to be central, economic growth, sustainable development must have an interrelationship. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tolk. Basically, I've been in, in a learning position up here as a foreign policy practitioner amongst, amongst all the scientists here. And, and what I clearly take out from this meeting in the afternoon is that health and environmental conditions are two inseparable conditions that we need to really consider when talking about these issues on an international level, be it in negotiations, be it in bilateral contexts, wherever. It has become obvious that healthy people can only live on a healthy planet, to use the phrase, but I'm not sure whether this has make, made the task of sustain, uh, supporting health easier or more difficult. Uh, I think that the final decision has not, not been made, but uh, one thing is sure that we as foreign policy practitioners, foreign policy people, need to make sure that health will be set on the agenda of much more, many more international fora and conferences because it's so much at the heart of many things and uh, we are not here to, uh, to follow any funny goals but to make sure that people have uh, a decent and healthy life on this planet. With this final remark, I'd like to thank all the participants, the speakers up here, especially the minister who has come a long way from Ghana, all the participants in the hall who have managed to stay until 20 minutes past six, 20 minutes longer than expected, and I wish you a nice evening. Hope to see you at the WHS, what is it called? Not party, but night, the WHS night tonight. Okay, thank you, and bye-bye. Okay.